Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. We're happy to have Dr. Gwen Ash, who is certified in Texas as a middle and secondary English language arts and reading teacher, master reading teacher, and reading specialist with an ESL credential. She is currently a professor at Texas State University, where she has taught since 2004. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in literacy methods, literacy assessment and interventions for students who struggle with school-based literacies, children's and young adults literature, and creating and evaluating literacy professional development. Her research examines teaching literacy in middle and high school, creating frameworks for middle and high school, and critiquing and analyzing children's and young adults literature. Please welcome Dr. Ash. Hello, <laughs> uh, and welcome to what is my first webinar. So I hope that um, it goes well uh, for all of us. Um, we will be taking questions during the presentation, so feel free to add them to the screen. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started here. So, um, so I'm presenting on critical media literacy. Uh, who can you trust engaging media, critical media literacy in the middle and the high school classrooms as well? Um, and I'll have contact information at the end uh, where you can look at for contacting me. I wanted to start out today talking about um, essentially the story that led me to start looking at ways to support uh, students. Um, I was um, working with some colleagues on a, a project at a local high school, um, and we had an uh, example happen at the high school of really what the kind of good critical media literacy we'd like to see in students uh, take place. Um, and critical media literacy, to give a little background, is defined uh, by the New London Group as a way to really help kids be a part of society, ways to use literacy um, as a way for them to interact, interact with the public, um, to interact with a, a community voice, and, and also uh, how it affects their economic life. So this story started um, right after winter break, and the students came back from winter break, and um, often we all know that there are unannounced um, assemblies that happen at schools a lot, and the students were asked to all go to the um, uh, gym slash cafetorium, and uh, they were there for a talk, but they really didn't understand what the talk was about. And this is a quote from one of the students who was there um, who follows up on that, that you know, everyone in the building was required to be there. There wasn't really any information. We didn't know what we were walking into. And what they were walking into was a presentation by a local um, startup uh, CEO who had begun uh, an app and he was giving uh, an inspirational talk. Um, his theme was passion uh, and he talked about his passions and he talked about the creation of his app, uh, Be Somebody and how that was his passion. Um, and the he was in some ways a little uh, bro-ish in his presentation. He used some language that most of us might not expect to see in a presentation in a high school. Um, and he told students that they should not have plan Bs, they should only go for their plan As um, and really embrace their passions. Now, a lot of times at a high school, what might happen uh, is that the students would listen to the presentation and go right back to um, what they were doing. Uh, but right away, some of the students um, started talking to their teachers about uh, how they thought it was odd that he had come to the school where he was really selling something, the app, um, but he was trying to hide his sales pitch within this uh, inspirational speech. Um, Others thought that they had been asked to sit through commercial at school and had trouble with that. Some students questioned why he was able to use language that they would not have been able to use or they would have been in trouble uh, for using. Um, and, you know, that might have ended at that, a little grumbling to the teachers, and, and then they moved on. But at this particular school, there uh, is a lot of uh, emphasis on media. There's a, a video media class, and there is a written media class. Uh, and what's happened was first the video media class created a video parody of the commercial. Uh, and this parody is available for viewing still on um, the uh, web. You can go to the YouTube channel of the local group. The, the, the channel is called 
K-A-H-S, which is for the high school, but it's pronounced chaos. Um, and so if you go to the chaos channel, you can see their Be Chaos video parody. And in the parody, the students really demonstrated a lot of uh, literacy skills. They went through and uh, used hyperbole, caricature, parody, burlesque, allusion to other things. Um, they created a faux documentary as a genre um, and that they called some of the questions that others had brought up, that sacrifices were called for by the speaker, but were not made, um, that an argument was made for passion, but it was about selling things, um, and that students and teachers have passions, but don't need apps to pursue them. And that was posted on YouTube and, and was there for a while. And then uh, about a week later, uh, the school news magazine, uh, The Maroon, published an editorial, which made some of the same arguments, but was a written critique of the concern. It was written by the staff writer, uh, Sean Saldana. Uh, and it went live um, first in print and then online. And uh, this particular high school has a lot of followers who, um, people who read the news because they live in the neighborhood or alumni or parents. So it, go, it does go belong, beyond the high school in terms of audience. And his argument, he was making a persuasive um, opinion essay, um, and he argued that it wasn't really a sacrifice when you had a quarter of a million dollars in stock options to cash in, that saying don't have a plan B, have a plan A is easy to say when you've already graduated from college uh, and you have other options, um, that the speech was commercial and that schools were not um, a good place for commercials for for-profit companies. And what happened was a member of the chaos group then tweeted the editorial to uh, Cash, who was the, the leader of Be Somebody. Um, and he then viewed the uh, editorial and wrote a blog post where he attacked uh, the school students and the teachers for questioning his message. Um, and he concluded his blog post in this way. Um, all I ask is that you decide, find your passion, then use it for good, gift it to the world. While healing yourself, the fire of passion is the most powerful force in the universe. It can light up the world or convert it down. You can hear in his voice the way he might have had an inspirational talk. Well, adolescents, as you know, uh, if you're here as a middle or high school teacher, are most likely to burn it down if given an option. So that was what started happening. And the discussion moved to Reddit, um, where different Reddit community members started uh, discussing what was happening. So it's moved beyond the school population at this point. Um, passionaries started joining in the back and forth on blogs and um, also on Reddit. Um, and most of the community was very supportive of the students that they, they liked that he, they were being critical in, in their analysis. Space Manatee is one of the Reddit contributors. So. Um, and with all of this back and forth, it started trending on Twitter, on Reddit and other places and traditional news sources noticed what was happening. So then we had our local uh, education reporter from KUT, which is the local uh, net public radio station, uh, pick up and do a piece on it. And in general, she found that people were really surprised that the startup had challenged the kids' critical reading, and most people um, had concerns about he was getting mad because high school kids had done a critique of his talk. And then from there, it spread pretty quickly. Um, so we had the piece that was on NPR, and then it was in Texas Monthly, and then the BBC came knocking. And then finally, it appeared on PBS NewsHour uh, as a discussion uh, of, of what happened. Um, and throughout a lot of this, what the students were engaging in was a very critical reading, not only of the original text, the speech when they came to the high school, but also critical reading of what they saw online in the posts, in blog posts, in posts critical of them. Uh, and they were able to respond to those in, some would argue, a much more mature way than the adult who was engaged in the discussion. Now, we wrote an article about this for the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy, in which we included a lot of the students as authors as well, because we wanted to have their voices in talking about what happened. Um, but then I wanted to set, think about how could we help support students who are not already functioning at that high level in, in interacting with uh, media, and how could we help support them in becoming more critical of the things that they read on social media, like Twitter, um, or also in larger media, media scopes. So that's where we are now. 
Now this presentation and a lot of my work is actually grounded in uh, the four reader roles was what it was originally called. And then the four resources model, which was developed by uh, Freebody and Luke. And I've done some adaptations to it in writing. And they make the argument that to be uh, an effective reader in the 21st century, uh, readers have to be able to do four things. They need to be code breakers, meaning makers, text users, and text analysts. For most uh, teachers, Codebreaker is not going to be a surprising role. Uh, it includes all the things that we think of as breaking the code of text, knowing how print works, understanding how to read different layouts of text on a page, uh, understanding how to um, decode unknown words, figure out what they might mean, but also phrases, um, and having some multiple strategies for working on the code itself. So Codebreaker, most teachers are pretty comfortable with that. Meaning maker, same thing. Meaning maker is essentially what we have come to think of over the last 30 years as the good reader strategies. Um, so all the things that readers do while interacting with text, using background knowledge, drawing inferences, making predictions, acting, asking questions. But the last two roles might be less familiar to us, even though we probably engage in them all the time as adults. Text users are, um, how we decide the purpose of a text and how we would use a text, whether it's a text we are uh, consuming or a text we're creating. So really thinking about purposes for reading, uh, different methods of expression. For example, when would a video be a certain kind of response? Would a, when would a written essay be a certain kind of response? How would people interpret those different media differently? Um, and also thinking about how our responses and expression might differ depending on the situation uh, in which we're in. So text user, a little newer. And then text analyst teachers, I think are pretty familiar with in one particular way. There's those standardized test questions, which always seem to be problematic for students uh, that ask a question along the lines of, with which of these statements would the author most likely agree? Uh, where they're asking the students to uh, drill down into author point of view or perspective. And certainly that author's point of view or perspective is a big part of text analysts. And it's also looking at author's purpose. Why was the text created? Um, point, of, point of view that is absent. So if the author is presenting this particular point of view, what point of view is not being addressed or discussed, uh, thinking about any sort of expectations that the author has that are presumed uh, to be um, held on the part of the audience or not. Um, and then as a reader, um, acknowledging the message that is being conveyed to you, deciding whether or not you agree with that message and taking away your own personal beliefs and reflections on the text after you've interacted with it. So text user and text analyst are a little different than a lot of what we've thought of as traditional literacy, um, but they become particularly important in looking at critical media literacy. Uh, and with critical media literacy, we're often looking at texts that uh, we don't think of as necessarily school-based texts. Um, it's not an approach where they have a notebook where you can buy, you know, here are the best readings in American literature. You know, so here are the best social media uh, texts that you can use to teach about this. It often requires gathering texts um, uh, from reality, um, bringing them in, having students bring texts in. People argue that critical media literacy is much more democratic because sometimes teachers uh, take the back seat because students may be more knowledgeable about particular areas. Uh, as an example of this, we'll talk later about different social media use. Younger teachers out there, you might be using Snapchat, but many teachers my age um, are probably not using Snapchat or Instagram as much as younger people are. Um, and so there will be different levels of knowledge in thinking about that. And that all of social media literacy is looking at um, how we can challenge a hegemony, a, the idea of power, um, and thinking about how power differentials uh, are shaped in these different interactions. So as teachers, we often end up making uh, a lot of materials ourselves because it's not a set curriculum. Uh, and I'm going to, hopefully if I do this right, switch over so you can see my computer. And I'm going to go to um, a piece that I um, developed. So 
when we think about fake news, sometimes uh, we we don't think about the different kinds of materials that are available. And um, I, by the way, have made this PDF available to Lindsay. So it, it's just uh, it's larger. It prints out tabloid size um, at its smallest, and I use it to create classroom size pictures. Um, and it's a PDF, so you can have it to, to use as you would like to use. Um, but it's looking at intent to deceive as um, a function of different kinds of texts. Sorry. Um, so there are texts, for example, that are purposefully misleading. Um, so things that are bogus to start with, they're completely fake. But then we also have propaganda, which is fake, but has created to communicate a particular message. So it is often persuasive in its nature. Then you have partisan texts. Um, and although partisan is often used in political discussions in the US, partisan simply means sided, right? So that there is one side or another. And so when materials presented by the Sugar Council, um, the material might be seen as skewed or biased in their perspective versus something being uh, presented by the uh, diabetes group in the same way. And then there is uh, clickbait, which we're probably all really familiar with. And clickbait is when uh, a text often might have a misrepresentative headline. Um, so where the content in the story itself may not be misrepresentative, the you might be drawn to click on it by a, a headline which is at least somewhat spurious or at least uh, uses hyperbole. So those are the things that are definitely fake. But then we also have um, texts that can be misleading if you don't understand the context. Um, and you may have seen this even with peers um, on uh, Facebook or other social media, for example, where they might share something from a satire site, like The Onion, as an example, um, thinking that it is realistic news because they don't understand that The Onion is um, uh, a satire site. Going with this is also sponsored content. Uh, we used to see a lot more sponsored content uh, primarily in print. You see it a lot in magazines where there might be an entire story in a beauty magazine that is sponsored by the makeup that is discussed in the article. Or I see it a lot in in-flight magazines on airplanes uh, where a city might have a sponsored section. Uh, and it's all about the great things to do in Charlotte, North Carolina, but it was paid for by the Chamber of Commerce of the city of Charlotte. So sponsors content um, there, it's really a long infomercial and you have to think about that context when you're evaluating the information that's being shared. In it. Now there's also misleading information and this is probably sometimes the most difficult for people to ferret out where the text is misleading, uh, but it's been created by people who we might argue are misled themselves. So they are not creating the information purposely to mislead people. They are, as you might say, a true believer in the sense. Um, so here you get uh, things that would fall under conspiracy theories. Um, also pseudoscience. Uh, would come under here. And then just plain misinformation when someone um, has information or has found information that is incorrect and they are sharing that information and they're unaware that it is misinformation or incorrect. And then finally we have the situation, and I, I think it's important to talk to students about this, where um, a, a, a new source may provide information that's completely wrong. Uh, and in the case that if the, it, they do do this, then there should be, um, if they are a reliable source, there should be an immediate um, identification of errors, uh, full publication of errors, um, and discussion. Apologies. <laughs> so I'm back. Uh, the All these different types of news uh, are important because we see, um, as in this uh, New York Times story, how um, a story can begin from one area and move through a variety of areas depending on the knowledge of who's using it or if people are using it for different purposes. So they have an example here of a story uh, that began um, first from a parody site in Russia uh, and then moved into more what we would think of reputable organizations because there was either some miscommunication, some misunderstanding, or some purposeful use of content um, that something was shared in a non-satirical way 
even though it started from a satirical starting point. Uh, and so kids need to be aware of how things can shift and morph as they move, move through these different types of news. Um, and that is a hot link, by the way, to the story if you want to read the complete story about how the news went through. So we might start out with kids by just discussing whether they can separate real from fake news. And I do have um, a source for that as well. And I'm probably gonna mess things up again by doing a screen share, but let's see. So that's a hot link um, to this site, which is a game. And it is, um, available. I've played it a lot of different times. I don't know what stories are going to come up, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, and it tests your new sense. It presents um, some information, and then you have to decide um, if the article's real or if the article is fake. So I'm going to start it up here. Um, and it gives multiple rounds as it works through. Uh, and so we've got a headline, and we have some original text um, from a story. And it's about uh, the weasel shutting down the world's most powerful particle collider. Uh, so we read the story and then we make an evaluation for ourselves. Do we think this is real? Okay. Well, uh, I do know that CERN runs the largest uh, particle uh, collider. Um, I don't know if that is an actual picture of a weasel, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and guess here. I'm going to say that this is a real story. We'll see if I'm <laughs> So it is a, a real news article uh, and it gives you then the source uh, and you can click on the hot link and see the actual article. Um, and it gives information about the source as well. So I'm gonna continue and see what we get as a second one here. Okay, Pope Francis will focus on fake news. Okay, Pope Francis wants to talk about fake news. He tweeted this. Okay, interesting. So um, it gives an exact date. That's something that might suggest that it would be real, but the Pope has certainly been center to a lot of people uh, using him for different messaging that he has not necessarily communicated. Um, but it says that he tweeted it. I do know that he has an active Twitter account, so I could go check the Twitter account to see if it's accurate. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click accurate. We'll see what happens here. Okay, so it was a news article and it's from Time. Uh, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to see if we can get a fake one here. Um, okay, here we go. New Google Companion Nano Chip tracks your baby's life, auto posts social media pages. Hmm. So it's a chip that will track the child's emotion, memories, and experiences. Now, this sounds a little bit more like something from Black Mirror, if you've ever watched that, uh, which is a, a dystopian sci-fi series from uh, the United Kingdom. So I'm thinking Google may have gone pretty far, but I'm not sure they're there yet. So I'm going to go ahead and say no. Okay. And it is. Um, and it gives the source of who published it. I've never heard of Empire News and they have that as a question. So we might, they have a common sense uh, test and then also some things that you can look for. For example, the Google CEO is not named. Specific places or locations are not given. So I should be back on the slide now. And um, so that game, Factitious, is available uh, to use with your students. Um, but now what I want you to do is, is take a look at some social media. This was something that was posted relatively recently um, in March. Um, and you can see it's a photograph. Um, and there is both a um, post from Twitter uh, on the left and then a Facebook post uh, on the right. And I'm gonna move to the next slide so you can see that in its larger format here from the group that posted it. Uh, and normally, if we were in uh, a face-to-face -face situation, I would have you turn to your neighbor uh, and th think about some of these following questions. Um, but I'd like for you to think for yourself when looking at this picture, um, some of the things that you might do. So if you saw that come up on your feed on Twitter or on Facebook um, or Instagram, um, here's some questions for yourself. Would you check to see if it was real? Why or not? Try to think about that for yourself. Um, how might you check to see if it was real? You know, what sort of uh, questions would you go about asking? Um, and then um, how could you possibly find answers 
two questions if you had some questions that you asked. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of think time for that. In case you want to look back at the pictures while you're thinking here. All right, so we're going to talk about some things that you might do or you might have thought for yourself of what you might do when you read through this material. Um, ways that people go about evaluating sources and thinking about viewpoints and tone across different social media platforms. So um, are things on Twitter in particular tone? How about how well do you know people that you follow on Twitter versus people who are your friends on Facebook? That might affect the way that you interpret uh, different pieces of material that are shared with you. Um, might also be thinking about how social media you use to communicate um, your particular voice or your particular perspective in terms of the stories and topics that you share. Um, in Texas here, we had an example uh, a couple of days ago when our uh, Secretary of Agriculture um, shared a piece that turned out to not be, uh, it was fake news, but both he and his social media coordinator said that, you know, they, they're not responsible for deciding if uh, the things they share are fake or not, it's really up to the audience who reads them because they're sharing them to communicate a point of view. And he is not alone in sharing that perspective. Um, there, there have been a lot of studies that have looked at how what people share on uh, social media. It's more important to them that it aligns with their perspective or ideas than if they're sure that it is accurate or true. Um, and so that makes things doubly difficult uh, for people who are unsure uh, if the material is. And then we would also think about how, if our students do that. Uh, and I, that's why I think discussing this with students is important because the first time I read that, I was I was very surprised that there would be people who would knowingly share information that was incorrect because they believe it aligned with their perspective. But it, it, it was, a I mean, a, not a, an unusual response from some people. And so, and I think from younger people, um, the, the response was even more so that that content was possible. So one of the first things that we can do to start to investigate this picture is to do a Google reverse image search. And um, if you are familiar with Google, as I'm sure everyone is by now, you've done a Google search. Um, but you can also take a photograph and search for its origins. And I'm going to click to sharing again so that you can see. Uh, and we're going to go through the process of sharing, searching for it. So I'm here at Google Images. And Google Images, um, you can see the URL here, images.google.com. And you can see I've got some prompts here. I can um, search by voice for particular images, or I can search by image. And if I want to search by image, I have a choice between either putting in a URL. So if I find an image on a page, I can put that page's uh, URL in there and search by that, or I can upload an image. So what I did was I downloaded the photograph. Um, here we go, um, from the Twitter page. And I have mystery picture here, so I'm gonna upload that. And it's taking the file. And it gives me some information about the image and it demonstrates where it has been. And it's like, oh, interesting. So many of you may have recognized early on that that was a picture of Britney Spears, not a picture of Emma Gonzalez. Some people are too young to remember the time when Britney Spears shaved her head and went a little um, off the rails. Um, but for those of us who are older, we remember, wow, yeah, that happened quite a while ago. Um, and so then we have um, a story here even about how old people fell for a Britney Spears meme. Well, was it necessarily old people? Maybe young people thought. Here's another story, thought the picture was uh, Emma Gonzalez. 
here's a fact check that comes up regarding it. Here's an actual sharing of it on Reddit. Um, and then there's a Snopes story, etc. So just by putting in the image itself, I can find more information out about its um, origins. It will tell you often, if I'd gone farther through that uh, Google search, it can take me all the way down uh, to where they first identified it being shared um, on uh, Facebook, which, you know, as I was called, it was about a decade ago uh, that that picture was shared, and it had to do with paparazzi, um, not um, the Second Amendment or the NRA. So an image search is one thing that we can do. And because a lot of media that students consume, um, and this is particularly true of younger people, uh, younger people tend to use more visually driven social media. So when we think about Snapchat and Instagram, uh, they are more driven by images. So being able to search an image can be very effective for being able to evaluate the veracity of something that they've done. So we can do a Google reverse image search. Um, we can follow the link on the page. So if I followed the link on the actual page that was sharing it on Facebook, it takes you to a page. And let me switch you over so you can see it. Um, that discusses um, the story. But you notice here it tells us something about the site that we're sharing it. Right here they call themselves snooze, now news that is satirical, satirical news. And so simply by clicking through on who shared the image, we had some additional information on the veracity of the image. Uh, and then we can also use fact-checking sites. And two of the uh, most common uh, used uh, fact-checking sites for, for hoaxes in particular are Snopes uh, and Hoax Alert. Uh, we also have uh, PolitiFact that might be check, checking more text-based information. So you can see those both here um, as sources that could be used uh, for evaluating that. So what I'd like to do for um, a little bit of time here is to go through and have you do a search for a particular headline uh, from the internet and think about um, how you might do it. And I want you to look through some of these headlines are accurate and some are less than accurate um, and will uh, allow you a chance to do some research. There we go. Um, so you should be able to see this now. Uh, and this is something that I took and I modified from a couple of different activities from the museum, which is a great resource, by the way. The museum is located in Washington, DC, and it's actually a, a history of journalism museum, but they have online uh, materials available um, in a lot of ways in, related to a variety of different journalism activities, but some related to um, fake news. Uh, and then also the European group um, that has looked at media literacy. And I've combined some of the things that they've done with some other uh, headline that, that I found. And what I'd like for you to do if you choose a particular um, headline is to take the headline and in your Google search, enter both the headline and the particular source that I gave you, um, because the, the source is a part of the evaluation. So we have here, why a Canadian's town water supply turned pink. Toast and dark chocolate accelerates weight loss. Research claims it lowers cholesterol and aids sleep by the Express. So if you can take a look at those, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about uh, what you can do. Select one of the headlines and then find out what you can about that particular headline. And we're going to come back and, and discuss them for a little bit. So I'm going to give you a few minutes here. If you've got any questions, don't forget that you can ask them in the question queue. Um, and I can respond to them uh, live here. Um, and you're also welcome to offer up responses through that question queue um, as we have the discussion. So I'll give you a few minutes here to work on that. 
Yes, I was keeping, uh, sorry, I got a note from Tactical Sport that I haven't stopped screen sharing. I left that up so that people could see the headlines right now. Um, and I will flip it back in a few minutes once they can get down the headline that they have. Oh, but I see what you're saying. I'm now on this rather than on that. Gotcha. Okay. See, this is what you get for getting an amateur, a Luddite, a veritable Luddite doing a webinar for you. So here's the headline. So you're never sure about what to do about wait time when people are not physically here with you. And uh, I don't have a way to see your response. I'm going to click back quick just to see if I have any questions. All right. So if we go through and discuss these headlines, um, if you looked them up, we're going to start with the go through in order uh, as an idea. So why Canadians town water supply turned pink is a real story. Um, and uh, you can read the article. It discusses um, how a particular chemical that's added in the water cleaning process, uh, if overused, can turn water bright pink. It includes actual images of the water being pink, other instances historically that this has happened, uh, and links to uh, pages where uh, different chemists discuss why this happens. So although it seems surprising, it is actually a true story. The second one, the big hospital finally telling the truth about cancer, um, if you looked on the page itself, some of the things that you might have noticed, um, and this is some of the things that we look at for students will we'll have uh, in an algorithm in a second, there's a lot of advertisements on the page. Um, and uh, if you Google the title more um, with actually putting Johns Hopkins in the title, Johns Hopkins actually has a page debunking uh, this site. This, this story actually began as an email share um, quite a long time ago, almost two decades ago. And um, they finally decided to put up their own debunking uh, regarding the story itself. So searching outside of the source, once you've read the original source, can be a way to look for particular information. Um, the slain gorilla, that one is a satire, and the lapin might be something that you're not as familiar with as the onion, but it is a Canadian um, satire newspaper. Uh, and so it, you would treat all things that come from the lapin the same way you would treat things coming from the onion. The London Sewer Overwhelmed by Giant Fatberg is an actual story. Uh, and Dark Chocolate Accelerates Weight Loss is a strange story into itself. I'm going to go back into our page here. And uh, the story is um, that actually um, that was published from a published research article on weight loss and dark chocolate. But if you follow back the story, and you'll see it in a Google search if that was what you looked at, the person who did the original study created it as a way to evaluate the scientific reporting uh, of scientific reporters. Um, and so he created what was essentially um, a study that was meant to show information that wasn't useful. Uh, so it did show in a very small um statistical way that chocolate could aid in weight loss. Um, but the difference between the two groups was maybe an ounce or two over a long period of time. Uh, and he shared, he had it published in an actual peer reviewed journal and then saw it go out. And you might've even seen this as it appeared in a lot of different um, publications. I had to use that express link directly because a lot of other publications had put up um, uh, errata so noting um, once the material came out that that this was based on material that was not uh, shared accurately and they, they give the story of the hoax. Um, and so it is one that actually the people writing the newspaper and magazine articles 
we're we're duped uh, and use material that was less than helpful. And that's that's the hardest kind to try to identify because until the newspapers and magazines start to acknowledge that their the material that they used was not accurate, then it's difficult as as a reader uh, to do that evaluation. So. Um, that gave us a bit of an example of things that we, we can evaluate. And so some of the things that we looked at included the media source itself, evaluating the reliability of the media source, which is one of the focuses of the factitious game, how, how that works through. Um, any experience that you personally had with the event? Uh, so even going back to the um, story about Emma Gonzalez and the umbrella, who was really Britney Spears, um, you may have had personal experience with that that helped you evaluate the event. Also looking at the point of view or the perspective, does it seem like the, the story is pushing a particular point of view or perspective? All texts are biased, and I teach students that, that what they need to be able to do is identify the bias um, and if, identify if the bias is skewing the information being shared. Um, and, and that is up to a critical reader to identify and evaluate. Also thinking about resources, whether that's Google Image Search or Snopes or PolitiFact that can be used to evaluate headlines um, and using activities like this to help prepare students to read the world. I shared before uh, a different uh, infographic and this is an infographic here, sorry, that, um, was developed in coordination with students um, that is also, oh sorry, switch me back, is also um, effective for using as a poster size um, material in your classroom, uh, but it had a way for them to evaluate what they did when they went through looking at text. And we did this on, you know, a basic infographic creation uh, site, which are available free for, uh, uh, Educators to use. I have a free educator account on this. Um, and it, they go through the steps. So evaluate who wrote and published the news is one thing that they need to do. Who is the author? Why should we trust them? Who's the publisher? What are the publisher's goals or objectives? Uh, check the URL. Is it a legitimate do domain? Because a lot of places will use uh, domains that are slightly um, off from a domain that would be a trusted domain. Then having the students evaluate the product itself. Um, for example, is the headline in all caps? Is the story in all caps? Um, does it have too much punctuation? Like lots of exclamation points or question marks. Um, errors in grammar and spelling can be something that would also lead to questions about um, how trustworthy a piece might be. The use of hyperbolic language. You know, we teach about hyperbole. Um, as a piece of, as parts of figurative language, but is it very hyperbolic? Ads can also be a clue, looking for tons of ads and then surrounding the news, that means that they're probably trying to draw um, <coughs> traffic to a site where ad revenue is being generated. And then also evaluating the images, we did a reverse uh, in Google image search, looking at particular images, but you can also look at stories that use stock images are more likely to be fake, doesn't mean that they're actually fake, but it's a possibility that they're using a stock images ra rather than an image from the actual event that they're reportedly reporting on. We also get the situations where an image from one event is used to represent another event, like we saw here with the Britney Spears, uh, Emma Gonzalez conflation. You can also check on images being doctored. The, a Google reverse image search will show you an original photo um, that might be related to the doctored photo that you've seen. So in the recent case with um, the Secretary of Agriculture, it was a doctored image that was shared. And so the, the image, um, it would show the original image and then the doctored image uh, working through. Uh, and then the last part is really looking at um, the support for the news. If arguments are being made or if facts are being reported, is there specific information? Are there data and statistics? Uh, are there sites or links, active sites or links uh, for sources for the data? Does it have quotes from particular people? Are the people cited? Um, are there people who have expertise or experience in the area? All of these are important in thinking about how to evaluate the news. Look back here. 
so that's just a, a smaller version of of that um, infographic. But here's a, a much more lower tech um, that if you're not gonna in, in the image business and, and you're looking to develop it, this is one that a colleague and I developed for a workshop in, in looking at fake news. Uh, you know, reading people, we always like to have our um, strategy spell out words. So we, we decided we'd have it spell out hoax. Um, but it has the same kinds of steps, the same sorts of evaluation uh, work that, that takes them through, that they should harbor skepticism, and then there are questions that guide them on what um, that means, that they should opt for value, validation, um, they should authenticate the author, and then they should examine the resources that are available that, to them. But I find that the actual creation of algorithms like this. Um, this is one from the Newseum on junk news. Um, and again, you see the same kinds of questions being asked. That actually developing an algorithm like this with your students using student language in the same way that you would have um, different charts in your classroom is more effective than um, just hanging up a poster from the museum. You can order a poster from the museum that includes escape, but if we develop our own word with a class uh, and, and that has their cues, if they create their own mnemonic, then it's in their language. They're working more deeply with the materials uh, and how they would use them than if they're just looking at an algorithm that someone else has already created um, and possibly applying it if it fits for them. As some parting ideas before we get to the questions, uh, I did want to share, I alluded earlier to different genres or formats online and who might be using different kinds of information. And you can see how this breaks things out um, by age. Um, and, and it really reinforces that idea that I noted before that younger people are more likely to be using visually based media. So YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, than they are to be using textually based media. Media, like Twitter, even though, yes, you can have images and film uh, and Facebook, but they're not central uh, to the communication sources. And you look at really wide differences in some of these in terms of the proportion of age groups uh, using each of them. And this is um, including some other media that were not included in that original study. An older study that looked at younger students going down to 13, because 13 is typically the terms of service uh, age for most of the social media. Um, and you can see it's older because Vine and Google Plus are still on there as options. Um, we did see um, smaller numbers of students using Snapchat, but Snapchat was very new at the time that this study was done. And the Pew hasn't done this study again um, more recently. So it was done in, in 2013 and 2014. Um, and uh, Tum I, would, I would guess that both Tumblr, Snapchat, and Instagram probably have much larger populations in those, young, in those younger demographics than they do currently. So what is your role as a teacher? Well, you get to be collaborative as experts together. The kids know the technology. They know how Snapchat works and how those stories are told. They use the platforms. But we know argumentation and rhetoric, and we understand the methods that people might use to be persuasive um, or to hide information or to present a biased perspective on a text. Um, and so our knowledge of some of those things, including uh, rhetorical fallacies, uh, can be helpful in, in showing the students how that's demonstrated in the media that they're working with. The other idea is to thinking about how kids um, can bring in material like this so that they can share the information that they have and how they can create their own media. And the creating their own media is particularly um, interesting because there was a recent, there's a recent work done in uh, Europe with this site, and I believe it was done in the Netherlands, and they did research with adolescents and the game itself, and so you can link through to this game um, to play the game. What it does is it presents information on a particular site, and then it actually takes the student through the steps of creating fake news, creating a fake story. And what they found was practicing that, engaging in creating news that was less than uh, truthful, uh, actually made the students more able to identify 
material that was less than truthful on the web. So the creation of material seems to be as significant as the consumption of materials in, in becoming a critical reader. So um, my last slide is just uh, my contact information. Um, these are emails um, and these are some of my web pages. Um, I am on Twitter, but I do not tweet very often, but you're welcome to follow my professional uh, handle at In The Muddle. Um, and obviously you can reach out to me through email if you have questions. And I think we have time now if people want to uh, begin to share questions on the queue. I think Lindsay is going to help mediate some uh, question and answer time. Um, should I move over a little bit so I'm more in the picture? Oh, wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, I know it's how in we case there are any that one out. I know it's questions. How we need to figure that one out. <laughs> So it looks like we do not have any the questions at the moment. I'm going to give just one one minute to see if anybody would like to pose a question to Dr. Ash while we have, have a few minutes left. All right. Well, I think we can say goodbye and thank you so much for joining us today and uh, sharing all this great information. As Dr. Ash mentioned during her presentation, there will be slides available um, and we will have the recorded webinar uh, so people can review at their leisure.